uh, it's always ritual, sacrifice is always a ritual event, but it was also a political statement. And it was a kind of form of intimidation. By the time of Ahuitzotl's death, the Aztecs had institutionalized sacrificial killing and turned killing on the battlefield into an art form. They were the America's fiercest fighters, an elite cadre of whom would have a spectacular new mountainside temple dedicated to them. But even they were not prepared for the war of the worlds that was about to descend upon them. Aztecs used obsidian to craft their blades, a volcanic stone so sharp it's utilized in modern day eye surgery. 1502, Ahuitzotl, Emperor of the Aztecs, is dead. Moctezuma II, a 34-year-old former priest, comes to power. A world away in Spain, an 18-year-old notary named Hernán Cortés is preparing to cross the Atlantic to join in his country's conquest of the New World. This is the zenith of the Aztec Empire. It now covers at least 80,000 square miles, reaching out from Tenochtitlan to both coasts and as far south as Guatemala. Some 25 million people are subject to Aztec rule. 38 provinces containing innumerable city-states are paying them heavy tribute, making the emperor and nobles fabulously rich. The city spread out, glittering against its canals and its lake, bedecked with fine trees and beautiful mansions. And Moctezuma II presided over it all. He was known for his statesmanship and military skills. A tough leader, he slaughtered the population of towns that wouldn't bend to his rule. But privately, he was troubled. It seems that Moctezuma was a passive individual, perhaps even a depressive individual. Legend says that when he witnessed a comet streaking across the skies over Tenochtitlan, he spent the rest of the night in tears. As the weeks went by, he became increasingly paranoid. But at the height of his obsession with the supernatural, a very real threat approached from across the sea. Spies posted along the Gulf Coast reported strange sightings offshore that they were at a loss to describe. They never have seen a boat, so they didn't even have a word to, 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 to describe that. So the Indians referred to those boats as mountains that move in the water. In 1519, after sailing from Cuba, Cortez landed with 11 of these floating mountains and 500 men on the Gulf of Mexico, 200 miles southeast of Tenochtitlan. The tribes were astonished by these men with metal armor and animals they had never seen. As he moved inland, tribes who resisted were brutally slaughtered, but many others were happy to provide him with provisions and men. One of the ways in which one local lord down on the Gulf Coast curried favor was to give Cortez and his company a group of women who were to not only provide for them in housekeepers sort of manner, but were also clearly meant to be courtesans as well and provide sexual services to them. But among the concubines, one in particular caught the eye of Cortez himself. She was the daughter of a chieftain who had been sold into slavery and was called La Malinche. They developed an intimate relationship and in time she bore a son to him. And he would have been one of the first people of mixed blood in the new world. But she was much more than a mistress. She became an interpreter for Cortez and her role expanded to advisor and intermediary between him and the Aztecs. Not only was she his translator, but she could also tell him about things that were being said that he was not intended to hear or understand. 
Moctezuma's network of relay runners kept him apprised of the Spaniards' movements. It was clear they were headed for his city. As he advanced toward Tenochtitlan through the summer of 1519, Cortes amassed an army of thousands. Moctezuma's army of warriors numbered in the hundreds of thousands. They wore animal costumes on the battlefield to intimidate their opponents. Part of it was spectacle. You had just incredible costumes that the different warriors would wear. The most important warriors were knights, dressed as jaguars and eagles. The Aztec knights were initiated into their orders at sacred ceremonies at special temples like this one. This is the cave temple at Malinalco, one of six temples on this remote mountainside a few hours south of Mexico City. It was finished by Moctezuma II around 1502, shortly after his coronation. Now, over in Europe, Michelangelo was pounding out the David for the Republic of Florence. But while Michelangelo was carving the David, the Aztecs were here carving this temple right out of the side of this mountain. And it is the only temple in the entire Western Hemisphere built in this manner. At the bottom of the stairs, of Kualcali are the sculptures of two jaguars. On each side of the door, there are the remnants of two warriors. Now, the door itself represents the open mouth of a giant serpent. You can literally see its tongue coming out of the room. The Aztecs believed that this was the entrance to the womb of the earth. Now, the privileged warriors would come here, go into the room with sculptures of eagles, have their noses pierced, and offer blood and sacrifice to Huitzilopochtli, the god of war. But this would be by no means the last time these Aztec warriors would spill their blood. The first meeting between Cortes and Moctezuma would be peaceful, but the conquistador knew a huge and bloody clash between the old world and the new would soon take place. And the annihilation that ensued would become one of the most frightening events in the history of the Americas. Cocoa beans were so valuable a commodity to the Aztecs, they were even used as a currency. It is the fall of 1519. Spanish conquistador Hernán Cortés has finally reached the gleaming Aztec capital he has heard so much about, Tenochtitlan. When the Spaniards first saw Tenochtitlan, they thought they were in some kind of an enchanted vision. They thought they'd entered some kind of a dream. A massive force of native warriors allied against the Aztecs accompanies him as he advances on the main causeway into the city. The meeting of Cortes and Montezuma on a causeway approaching Tenochtitlan had to be one of the most remarkable events in world history. It's really a, a, a meeting of two different worlds. And Cortes offered his hand, but the minute he started to do that, to actually touch Montezuma, the noble attendants around Montezuma pushed Cortes away and said, no, 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 that's, that's a total indignity.